great evil? Where does it come from? How did it steal into the world? What seed? What root did it grow from? Who's doing this? Who's killing us? Robbing us of life and light. Mocking us with the sight of what we might have known. Does our ruin benefit the earth? Does it help the grass to grow? The sun to shine? Is this darkness in you too? Have you passed through this night? The certainties within the Imperium of Man that we can hold on to in the 41st millennium are sparse. Soon, we will explore some of the more tangible forces and organisations in the Imperium. What I want to embark upon is a three-part exploration of the darker and more shadowy places that are by any reasonable standards far beyond our comprehension. Ancient history, lost knowledge, paranoid rumours and outright heresy infects the minds of mortal beings. The gnawing desire to gaze upon something that should not and cannot exist. The impossible sight of creatures that alone would be enough to cause the strongest minds to lose their footing and the weakest to be tossed carelessly into the void. Worse would be to succumb to mortal weakness and endure death. Those few who are approved to explore beyond the boundaries of that which exists, beyond the worlds of mankind, such as Imperial Inquisitors, Rogue Traders and Mechanicus, may attempt or mistakenly happen upon the origins of the abyss of horror that is the Immaterium. Curiosity may creep in, and you may try and piece together the shattered remnants of Eldar mythology, or observe and uncover the ancient, seemingly ruined or abandoned tombs of these strange Xenos constructs known as the Necron or Necrontyr. Few answers are ever to be found, answers that are ultimately more likely to reveal a further endless sea of questions than gift you a glimmer of truth. What is the nature of chaos and its immortal entities? How did it come to be? The Eldar have seen such things come to pass, and they know this too painfully and too deeply. They have felt its power and learned that it cannot be contained or corralled. And what are the Necron, the most ancient of races, their own history, a tragedy, but who similarly know all too well what awaits them in the realm of the infinite void? Some might reasonably wonder how such a place which apparently ignores the laws which we know to constrain and govern our reality could have such severe impacts on the events that take place within our mortal linear perception of time. How can this occur, and why? Now firstly I'll say this series has a longer than usual introduction, and in each of them there may be more explanations of details, some sourced and some necessary logical assumptions, but please understand, I feel that it's necessary this time to just lay out all my thinking. Now later I may break this down into smaller edited versions that focus more strictly on the narrative elements or individual explanations, but the goal of this three-part exploration is mainly to understand what's happening in the big picture. Now this all started with me asking the question, how did the Chaos Gods come into being, and from our point of view, when? Yet this initial starting point ended up expanding over the past few weeks into becoming a sprawling look at the warp, its history, and how we reconcile it with our own reality. Chaos, the Eldar, the Old Ones, the Necrontyr, and the War in Heaven. I also will be assuming that if you're watching this you have already watched my previous video about Chaos or the 40k Primer. If you haven't, I recommend watching these first and then joining this series, but if you want to stay here I will eventually explain through all the details either way. In this first video we'll be looking at understanding more about chaos, how time is a problematic component of how we relate to chaos and it to us through the war. In the second video I'll be exploring the beginnings of the galaxy, the Old Ones, Necrontyr, Necron and Eldar Gods as well as the War in Heaven, and lastly we'll be concluding with my best assessment on how all these pieces fit together to bring us the origins of the Chaos Gods and even some other curious details about other races and the history of the galaxy. It has been, I don't mind telling you, mentally exhausting. Now as I always say, this is my personal best effort, but short of rereading every piece of official material ever written, 
I'm not infallible. What I've put into these three videos are my best explorations of the issue, and I always base this on sourced material first and logical speculations second. When I use a source or reference to validate a theory or understanding, I always use material that is as reasonably recent as possible and not excessively contradicted. I then cross-reference these things with other sources as best that I can. The reason I wanted to make this clear from the outset is because the topics we'll be looking at can bring out a lot of dissenting opinions. Many people consider some of the origin narratives to be closed cases and definitive, when they are in actuality anything but. Now I've dug in deep on this one, so I will say this, if you disagree with my opinion, or if you feel that you have a piece of reasonable official reference that sheds light upon something, please note that reference with a title, and preferably a rough page reference, and if you can, a quote in context. Now I say this because you would not believe the amount of speculative opinions that are all floating around, often with no sources backing them up, but then becoming seemingly commonly accepted. Yet when put under scrutiny, not only fail the logic test, but fail to materialize in any reasonable fashion within source material. So I do get a little bit more pedantic these days about people saying, I read somewhere. Well if you read it somewhere, go find it and then tell us where you read it. As you guys have seen the addendum I made regarding the Emperor Part 3, I'm always open to listening to and shifting opinions. For me, I care about coming to the best conclusions possible, but if you can't provide a source, it's hard to give it much credibility. As I said, just stating that I think I read this somewhere one time, it doesn't cut it. And what is it they say, trust but verify? You should all know by now that I'm a big supporter of people wanting to write, for example, fan fiction, or to speculate heavily on events within 40k. It's fun, it's really interesting. And to me, that's what 40k is all about. I spent forever, when I was younger, writing my own background material. However, for me, that fan fiction or that speculation should be done within the logical understanding of the existing framework, because otherwise, you're just making up random nonsense. Random nonsense like I used to as a kid. For example, my Chaos Lord, who was half fly with four molecular acid hands would be able to grab hold of Imperial Guardsmen and literally hug melt them to death. Or my other Chaos Lord who could absorb the souls of enemies and basically never die on the battlefield, gaining wounds from their souls. It's all fun stuff as a kid, but it's also game-breaking madness that if you try and put into actual context can undermine muddy the water in regard to everything else. Although I did really love my crazy acid hand melting flyman because he was brutal. So these videos may be a little bit more substantive than a visual narrative, and I often try to marry the two things together, but in these two videos you may have to forgive me if they are on the lighter side of visual editing. I know I often see comments from you guys saying, Luton, this is your most complex video, or this one has eclipsed the other, or well, trust me when I say that these three videos are my most complex. They have been far more taxing than anything else I've tackled before, which is why it's taken me three weeks primarily because they required so much extra referencing, cross-referencing, philosophical exploration, or just trying to form the narrative around scientific understanding that I'd barely read about before. I didn't quite reach the point of writing things all over the walls and windows, but it was getting close. And there are multiple aspects that have to be factored in. For example, the all too often heavily fragmented and shrouded ancient history of the oldest races in the galaxy. The needs to reconcile issues of causality, having to balance and make sense of continually contradicting sources, while also picking through and deciding how trustworthy a source is, their bias or their agenda, or if their characterization or use of terminology is even correct. Ultimately, it becomes very difficult to select which pieces of the puzzle are the ones you need and the deeper you start thinking about it, the more it becomes like falling into an endless void of confusion. Much of the information we have to work from, despite what some will always try to claim, is regularly extremely vague. While some things may appear or are collectively assumed to be near certainties, but then when you actually go and read the specific source yourself, the reality then calls into question your original understanding or may even render it no longer relevant. The reality is that in 40k at this stage there are so many references that some get pushed aside into the shadows. With all of that in mind, I think it's important to say that no matter what you might read or hear, things are very rarely definitively retconned in 40k, because that just isn't how the universe of 40k works. The very often deliberately vague nature of 40k and its constant contradictions, which despite what some would often suggest are often meant to exist as well as previous information, not to automatically replace what came before. This reality of visible contradictions I think just becomes intolerable for some people. 
And personally, I sympathise with this to a degree. It can be very annoying when you just want to know what the hell actually happened. But this is what 40k is, and it has been for decades. Regardless though of how any of us may want things to be, the actual reality is that usually lore elements are not immediately retconned, but instead they are slowly moved sideways and made less visible, until they reach their new accepted alignment. And that new position very well could be something actually being retconned. But when I say slowly, I mean 10 years, not 6 months. During that process of realignment, everything related to that description appears as an overlapping, blurry, multiple exposure where all things seem possible. And worse, even when it has been realigned, it's still going to be there, which is confusing for some people. So if you ever read someone saying that this has been retconned since forever, don't necessarily trust it. Not until you go and look actually for yourself or you find someone else listing a source for you. Because people misremember things very, very easily or they just choose to stick with their own version of events because they know most others aren't going to be bothered to go and look up what it is that they're saying or that they don't have the ability to go and look up what they're saying. Now I am not one of those people because I will go and spend an hour or more looking because these fragments of information formulate the whole picture. And I'll tell you now, if I had a pound for every person I'd read stating adamantly that their source was unquestionably correct because 90% of the time it's either just not there or a very, very loose, vague quote that could be interpreted in any number of ways. Now, as I said in my recent discussion about the Emperor of Man and using specific individual quotes from sources, how do you trust a source? Is one statement from one character good enough? What about if that statement is vague? What if there is another character somewhere else who contradicts it? Does newer automatically mean more correct? You might assume so, but in 40k, that's not necessarily true. What about if something is really vague but also repeated in other places but equally vaguely? How about if something's actually very clear and specific but wait, the person delivering the source is questionable or maybe they've got a bit of a dodgy agenda? You can see how this quickly makes things far from what you would call certain. In fact, it's not even a certainty on how law should be delivered. Some would prefer that things are all delivered very clearly in a specific timeline with details that ensure no contradictions occur with concrete established events and parameters. On the other hand, there are those who have been writing the law and a part of Games Workshop for decades who would argue that this is exactly the wrong way to go about things and in fact it should always be vague and unclear and questionable because it was never meant to be specific. It was meant to be a starting point for people like us to make our own interpretations. And I know that from reading so many of your comments, people have their own theories, their own speculations, all of which are greatly imaginative and that's fine depending on a certain person's point of view. The events and timeline of Warhammer 40,000 slowly come into clarity for us as time passes but we should also remember this is not a battle over who is right and who is wrong it's an ever-developing history that rightly will seek to correct and adjust the events and figures within it to organically allow for more expansion and development it'd be crazy to assume that something conceptualized decades ago would be forever set in stone yet at the same time maintaining continuity is always important to ensure the narrative stays true to its origins and is not horribly bastardized or warped by outside influences. It's also worth mentioning and remembering that where we gather this information is usually from official sources like codex or supplements, except some of these vary greatly in how much information they give. Very often the first edition, which is the period from 1987 to 1993, and third edition, 1998 to 2004, give us some of the most detailed descriptions, second edition to a degree. It's often surprising how across the years very little details have been updated. And this is what leads to people saying that if it was written so long ago, how can that continue to be true today? Well, you would be surprised. For example, there are things from 3rd edition that are only mentioned once in very small sections which have been used to continue the narrative into 8th edition. So it's simply wrong to say that things from this time are no longer relevant. This idea that because something was written a long time ago can never apply is absolutely incorrect. Now I personally consider anything from 3rd onward to be relatively viable, at least worthwhile of being investigated and cross-referenced. 1st and 2nd are pretty questionable, but a lot of it still continues to be true. But anyway, if we get into talking about that, it could fill a video all on its own. So with all that said, let's get started. <laughs> 
So let's begin with the thinking that stems from the original texts, where the description alludes to the Chaos Gods arising to full consciousness during the Middle Ages of mankind. Now before anybody starts writing out some long theory about how they all started during the War in Heaven, calm down. Okay, we're only just getting started here. Because when this was originally written, the world-ending wars of the wars in heaven during the early days of the galaxy were not part of the narrative. And the event that would begin to be gently suggested in second edition is now part of the official established background. And for that reason, many people very reasonably consider the original descriptions from first edition to no longer be the official origins of the Chaos Gods. However, this is not at all as clear cut as simplistically saying the war in heaven was huge and really bad and therefore the Chaos Gods must have originated during that time. As I said, far too often people want things to be very nice and simple and neat, to be absolute or definitive in 40k. Most of the time, they simply are anything but. It is always true, some things are fairly set in stone, some things are very very clear indeed, 40k by its very deliberate nature is clouded, vague, and regularly lacking in detail. So let's just get straight into things with a graphic and unpleasant example. Now I see all the time people continuing to try and argue that Nurgle is, and must be, the oldest Chaos God. And people seem happy to argue this, despite the fact that it is contradicted in most, if not all, the Chaos Codex. As is often the case, this has somehow arisen from, I think, unintentional community confusion, partly by mixing up or conflating fantasy lore with 40k lore. And I know some people think that it overlaps, and I will say I am open to that being the case, if only to a small degree. But even if it does overlap, it's irrelevant to the 40k timeline. The other most common talking point is the fundamental misunderstanding around the term Grandfather Nurgle, which is then equated as simply meaning Nurgle is the oldest. This is excessively simplistic and also just entirely wrong. The Grandfather Nurgle term is just descriptive of Nurgle's character as a Chaos God. It has nothing at all to do with age, it stems from Nurgle having what's described as a more personal touch that he watches over his followers like a doting patriarch. Typhus, formerly of the Death Guard, now Herald of Nurgle, gives us a good example as he observes in the novel Plague War an unfortunately graphic description of an Imperial human portmaster suffering this personal attention of Nurgle, and he delights as Nurgle ruins the poor man over and over, decomposing and recomposing him whilst keeping him alive, and in a fashion only that could be described as obscene horror, his body rotting, flesh tearing, splitting, bursting and so on. So extreme that even Typhus, who has seen his fair share of ravages before, is overcome and stands in awe, observing with grim fascination how the Lord of Decay is giving such attention to his suffering. Typhus watches as the following unfolds to the wretched portmaster. Bloody pus was pouring from his choking throat. The portmaster twitched. He was still alive and moaning as his body folded itself almost perfectly in half. Under normal circumstances he would have died, but Grandfather Nurgle is kind and wishes all those who are afflicted by his gifts to fully enjoy the experience. And so the man's soul remained confined within his body. His eyes rolled madly even as they bloomed with cataracts and sank in upon themselves. His lips split and his tongue turned black and fell from his mouth to writhe away like a salt-bathed slug. Stinking slurry pulled around him, his bowels leaked, bladder inflated and burst, still the man lived. A spectacle of rapid decay played out before Typhus's eyes, and he watched fascinated. The sheer variety of death Nurgle meted out was a glory in itself, and this was the finest Typhus had witnessed in some time. You are truly blessed by Nurgle. Such fecundity, and decay, such colour, such fertile ground for life you have become. Know this, little man. Few of your kind experience such exquisite extinctions, and fewer still are permitted to see the cornucopia of rebirth your mortal shells permit. You are favoured. The description gets continually worse, by the way. You can find it for yourself if you want to read the whole thing. But essentially, the grandfather term is all to do with this kind of attention from the god of plague. It's all about Nurgle's personality and his characteristics as a power. Nurgle's followers, like Typhus, are often enraptured by observing the beauty and artistry of decay. And just to repeat myself, it has nothing to do with any birth order in the warp, or growth, or sentience of origin. It's simply a characterization among his followers. 
So now we've put away that one for you straight away, it's worth as well mentioning that from 6th to 8th edition, that's 2012 until now, the description regarding the ordered origin of the Chaos Gods has been almost word for word the same, and the order through all of the Codex has been pretty much again the same. Since the dawn of time, these tides and waves have flowed unceasingly through the mirror realm of the warp, and such is their power that they form creatures made of the very stuff of unreality. Eventually, these instinctual, formless beings gained a rudimentary consciousness. The Chaos Gods were born, vast psychic presences made of the fantasies and horrors of mortals. These are the ruinous powers, and each is a reflection of the passions that formed them. First amongst them is Khorne, the Lord of Battle, possessed of towering and immortal fury. Zinch, the bizarre and ever-changing architect of fate, weaves powerful sorceries to bind the future to his will, whilst great Nurgle, the god of disease, labours endlessly to spread infection and pestilence. The last of their number is Slanesh, the Dark Prince, indulgent of every pleasure and excess, no matter how immoral or perverse. Now, the only other reference I found to some sense of Nurgle origin was in the Lords of Silence at the end of Chapter 11. There is hierarchy even across the great game. Desire, knowledge, rage, these are the lesser things, the subordinate things, the ones that came later. Before them, all was despair and succour, and the slow release into abandonment. This was what came first, the primordial slot from which all else arose, only then to float like phantasms over it. In the end, despair will prevail again. In the end, every world will be a plague planet, and the tide of decay will once more lap at the foundations of reality, drowning all else. As interesting as it is, this is very vague and at most only alludes to some sense of what came first. Now we can all make any number of logical rationalisations as to why it could be any other way. The most common one of course is that the Necron tier suffered greatly even before any wars, as they struggled with their own mortality and so this must have been what led to the creation of Nurgle, right? It's a reasonable rationale, unfortunately completely unsupported by actual reference. Maybe it will be one day, but for now it's just a speculative rationalisation. But as I say, other than that, it's been consistently stated from first to the current time that Corn is first, so we'll take that actually established knowledge and then make further conclusions around it. However, as I said, nothing in this is quite so simple, but we'll come to that. Yet another thing I feel is worth getting out of the way early, which is the thinking that says because the birth of Slanesh occurred in the most recent of times, you then hear people asking, well, if Slanesh's birth was so devastating, why weren't the other three as well? That is then usually followed by the additional rationalisation that this must then point to the fact that the other three gods were not born during any period of the human age, because otherwise we'd surely know about it if it's so devastating when a Chaos God is born, right? Again, no. It's important to understand that the creation of Slanesh was considerably different, because of what fueled it. These differences are referenced very clearly in the Harlequin's Eighth Codex, the most current. It describes how it was through a slow accretion of energies that the Chaos Gods Khorne, Nurgle and Zinch had been born. Accretion just means formed by cohesion. The birth of Slanesh, on the other hand, is also described in the Liber Chaotica, the 4th, 6th and 8th Eldar Codex, that the actual formation of Slanesh was also not a fast process. The Eldar's depraved slide into madness and horror beyond imagination had stirred up the warp to the point it had already created millennia of warp instability. The key thing to remember is that the Eldar themselves are considerably more psychically powerful than your average human pleb, even if the Chaos Gods do have more of a flavour for humanity. Also, the Eldar before the fall were far more connected with the warp. These factors contribute to the eventual event of Slaanesh's birth being far more devastating than anything else before. Not to mention that fueled by Eldar souls, it burst out of the warp like an atomic chain reaction, and as all the psychic energy from the warp storms were sucked into the implosion in the void, it consumes billions upon billions of Eldar and their souls, something that the other Chaos Gods seemed unable to do, consuming Eldar souls that is. The fundamental difference is very simply that the birth of Slaanesh involved the Eldar, whereas the other gods did not, and for that reason it was far more destructive. And there's no singular process that defines how a Chaos God should or must come into being either. So how did it happen for the other three gods? Well, at its simplest, what I've come to believe is that there are actually four potential possibilities with regards to the Chaos God's origins. I decided to outline these from the start, as I think it makes sense to do so, even if we don't discuss them in detail, in this first video. It's good to have a starting point. 
The first three ideas apply specifically to only the gods of Korn, Zinch and Nurgle, and the fourth includes Slanesh. First is that they were initially formed but not awakened, in what we would note as being the earliest days of the galaxy's history, so yes, the war in heaven, but that they were then later truly awakened during the period that we think of as the emergence of mankind. This to a degree satisfies all angles. Second is that they were fully born into the warp in a sentient state during the wars in heaven, which occurred again in this earlier period of galactic history. We could consider that both of these previous statements are true, which I'll explain in more detail later. Fourth is that because the warp does not observe linear time as we know it, the gods have always existed, yet also for periods in mortal reality never existed. This description of always having existed is attributed to Slanesh across multiple editions, but it seems reasonable that if it stands for one, it stands for the others as well. But again, we'll get into all the problems that this brings up later. Now, in all of this, there's also another factor in play, and it's something that I want to address in this video, and I've truly given my best effort to understand. That factor is time. Now, I'm no physicist, so cut me some slack if something is not spot on, because this stuff melts your brain. But you could say that some of the thinking I've done here is unnecessary and overthought, but personally, it felt necessary to me as I was working through this. So feel free to agree or disagree with me on the need to include this. Personally, I feel that it's important. Still, the warp and chaos in the 6th edition rulebook is described as follows. The sheer mind-boggling impossibility of the warp defies explanation, and those who attempt to delve further into understanding its ways inevitably slip into madness. I can tell you from how I have felt researching and compiling all of this, this is a perfectly accurate description. So onward we go. Please note I will be bringing in some occasional non-40k references in this next section just to help clarify. Looking into time and causality for me is fairly critical to both the rationalization of the Chaos Gods and just in helping us to get this stuff clear in the mind because I can see myself referencing back to this in the future. Now for me, in order to discuss the warp and its relationship to the material realm, we have to at least to some degree learn about time travel and paradoxes because time travel unfortunately is a thing on top of all the other foggy historical issues. Now I say unfortunately for reasons I hope will soon become clear. And I just decided to come back and actually add in this extra note because if we're talking about time travel there's going to be things we're going to be talking about to do with physics, to do with philosophy and some stuff as well to do with perception. So really what I've tried to do is just kind of take some of these existing elements and make it fit within what we're talking about within the law. So some of this stuff you're going to have to suspend your disbelief, especially of course when it comes to time travel. But really we're trying to just deal with the basic elements here to make a bigger picture fit. We're not super interested in drilling down on one specific point. And with that said, there's a couple of things I want to clear up from the outset because I think it's important to just kind of get it established. Now, if this stuff doesn't mean anything to you, that's okay. It probably will make sense as we go along or you might need to kind of come back and think about it some more. So basic causality, which is cause and effect. Causality can get very complicated very quickly, especially when you pursue philosophical lines of thinking. And for our own purposes, we really need to be thinking about is just the existence of backwards causation, kind of what that means. Now, multiple causes can lead to one effect coupled with whatever conditions are enabling it. One cause may lead to multiple effects. You can have feedback where an effect gives rise to new causes and effects, including back to the cause which gave rise to that one originally. In reality, the one cause, one effect illustration is too basic to really apply in what we're thinking of in terms of reality. But most cause and effect situations are, when you actually get into it, so complex, your main priority is to just determine which cause is the decisive part in a whole set of circumstances. And again, like I say you know if you want to look at a cause and effect situation you can spin it out to the nth degree but really what you're trying to get down to is just the primary main cause now one more i just wanted to add in here to get this out of the way and get this kind of established again if it doesn't make sense it probably will later backwards causation now that's essentially just where your cause is coming after the effect it's essentially the reverse process now it's important to note that the philosophical concept of backward causation shouldn't be confused with backward causation when we're talking about time travel usually that's where you're returning from the future to the past now these two concepts are only related in the sense that they both agree it is possible through a process of cause and effect to affect the past 
The difference between the two is that time travel involves a causal loop, that's a closed time-like curve, which we'll explain, whereas backward causation does not. Essentially, backward causation without time travel would involve an actual kind of reversal of time, not by the use of a time machine or warping of space-time. Again, if that doesn't mean anything, don't worry, we'll kind of get through this as we go along. But I just kind of wanted to get that in there, that the philosophy and the physics is a little bit different. But of course, as I also said, they do kind of overlap with this whole thing. So, you know, we don't need to drill down on it. That's my main point. It's just kind of like a general concept we're thinking of in terms of time, because we're thinking about the warp and we're thinking about chaos and the demons and the fact there's no time there. And we're thinking about reality and the materium and how there is time there. And we're trying to reconcile those two things. So like I said, there's a lot of overlap and it's not necessary really to go right down into it. And I'll just say one other thing, guys. I apologize if my voice is kind of all over the place. Um, I'm still in the process of recovering my damaged vocal cords. And so my voice gets extremely tired very quickly. So if you hear different qualities in my voice, it's just because of that. Nothing I can do about it. But it is improving. So. Also, some of this stuff can be hard to establish clearly in your mind. So below this video in the notes, I've included some simple definitions should you feel the need to refresh your memory. Now throughout all of this, keep in mind that what we are considering in the grand scheme of things is that from our mortal perspective, the Chaos Gods were somehow, at some time, born into existence. But that from the Warp's perspective, when this actually occurs, is completely irrelevant. Because there, they will have always existed in some sense. This is something you'll often see and hear in relation to the Chaos Gods, and the reason for this is that if the Warp has no laws governing time, then they could theoretically and very likely do exist at and use information from any point in time. As fun as this might superficially appear to be, it actually makes things extremely complicated and also creates all manner of problems. Regardless though, it is the reality of the Immaterium, I'll reference 6th edition Chaos Demons, where it has just finished describing the chronological events leading up to the birth of Slaanesh, and it states, That is how events are viewed from the chronology of the material universe. In the warp, things are different, for the Immaterium is not bound by linear time, and events do not occur in a strict sequence of cause, then effect. As his rival gods reckon it, Slaanesh has always existed in the warp, and yet has never existed at all. This description continues through to the current edition of the Chaos Codex. The concept of cause and effect being out of the logical sequence is deeply problematic, as is the idea of gods and Sunesh having always existed, but not because of how it affects things in the warp. The warp is the warp, anything goes. The problem is trying to somehow make any sense of it at all, or how one reality without any boundaries manages to interact with one which has strict boundaries. I should probably also mention that this is not exclusive to Chaos. Various other races, including humanity and the Eldar, have encounters which allow them to see into the past and the future. The Eldar even do this as a fairly regular matter of course via their Farseers, which gives us plenty of information on how we can interpret the perception of time as it is seen in the world of 40k and how that intersects with the unreality of the warp. So from the Warp's perspective, yes, the gods may always have existed. What we should also consider, though, is that while they are able to have existed within the Warp, from our perspective, within a linear timeline, they may not have always existed. And what's hard to understand about that? But before we get further into perceptions, first a small tangent. In researching this, I found several instances of people discussing the concept of time in the Warp. More specifically, a quoted phrase that crops up in several novels, such as Fulgrim, Battle for the Abyss, Descent of Angels. It's a phrase usually used in describing a demon, where it is said to be a creature older than time, or in relation to the warp, things exist in its fathomless depths that are older than time as we know it. Now, much as it aggravates me because I find this description to be just incredibly stupid, what it's clearly trying to illustrate is that the warp exists fully outside the constraints that bind us in regards to our understanding of what time means, as well as descriptions of the warp generally being utterly incomprehensible to us. If you want to go deeper, you could argue it may be trying to point towards the concept of the warp having depths that are as yet undetected and unseen, where it describes the fathomless depths being older than time. There was a theory, an actual physics theory, that I'd read which suggested black holes could be remnants of past universes that have collapsed in on themselves, and that this could have happened in a big crunch, and that they then somehow managed to exist despite subsequent big bangs. The premise being that the laws of physics when close to a point of a big bang or crunch become uncertain, and as a result such a primordial black hole could survive. 
Now why do I mention this? Well because if we accept the warp is a mirror reflection of our material realm, one could assume it goes through a similar process to that which occurs within our own material space, and who knows how that affects the entities within, if it affects them at all that is. Now I could then more readily accept that they would be older than we can reasonably comprehend, as was stated to be older than time. Then again, it seems just as likely that this phrasing of being older than time is, like many descriptions in 40k, simply an overdramatic way of referring to the fact that time isn't a thing in the warp. Now, coming back to our perceptions of time, our material realm from our point of view exists on a linear timeline. The warp exists outside of this and obeys none of the laws we consider essential in order to make any sense of things. We know this to be true of the warp, and with better descriptions than being older than time. Straight descriptions, such as it being a churning ocean of chaos, raw emotion, madness, given form where the laws of physics, time, nature are meaningless concepts and nothing is as it seems. Events with individuals, ships and so on may be lost for thousands of years in warp space only to then appear having apparently not observed any passage of time. A good illustration of this perceived time distortion occurs in the Night Lord's novel Voidstalker, where we discover that every marine within the warp can seemingly perceive time completely individually a concept that seems impossibly hard to wrap your head around. In this extract, Talos is a Chaos Marine. How long have you waged this war, Talos? He shook his head, feeling this sudden need to swallow. A long time, the heresy was the bloodiest decade. Then the raiding years, two centuries of bitter glory before the Imperium came for us. And how long since we left the Carrion world? For the Imperium? He narrowed his eyes at the question. Almost 10,000 years? No. How long for the traitor legions? How long for you, Talos? He swallowed again, beginning to sense where this was leading. The warp stole all meaning from the material realm, even banishing all pretense of physics and the temporal stability. The great heresy was days in the past for some of the traitors within the eye, and 50,000 years gone for others. All of them, each and every soul to betray the emperor in that golden age, could claim a different scale of time for the years since. Talos would say, a century since we left, less than many, but more than some. A century for you, a century for First Claw, that makes you over 300 years old. So in this description, we see from Talos's perspective that it has been 10,000 years since the Night Lords left their homeworld in the 32nd millennium to enter the Eye of Terror. In actuality, it turns out it's only been 300 years. So for Talos, time in the warp has been dragging on for an agonizing length of time. However, this could easily happen in reverse as the warp has no respect for the laws of the Materium. It could equally have been a century of time passed in the warp, but 10,000 years in material space passed. How you reconcile these perceptions while presumably interacting and planning with fellow marines in the warp is to nobody's surprise not expanded upon, for obvious reasons that it's incomprehensible. From the 5th edition rulebook, if the Emperor fails, then the demons of chaos will flood into the galaxy. Every living human will only become a gateway for the destruction of mankind, and the stuff of warp space will submerge the galaxy. There will be no physical matter, no space, no time, only chaos. Another example of a distorted passage of time occurs for Horus when he emerges from the warp portal on Davin, exclaiming to his Astartes retinue how surprised he is that they waited all this time for him. When in actuality the time passed for them has been very small, and they will seem fairly confused as to what Horus is going on about. Other events point to potential time leaps deliberately caused by chaos, such as the turning of Horus. In the novel False Gods, Horus is spoken to by a demon who shows him a vision of the future. A future where the Emperor is being worshipped as a god. Pilgrims and religious worshippers are flooding the streets, and while he observes some statues of Primarchs, statues of Horus and some of his other brother Primarchs, however, are missing, and this immediately disturbs Horus. The demon twists this vision by misleading Horus into questioning what the Emperor's true overall intentions are, and more importantly distorts his perception of how such things could have come to pass. Most importantly, we need to take note that the demon is not simply showing Horus a crafted imaginary vision. It's much more than that. It's showing him visions and information from the future. The past, of course, is relative to your position in time, but that's exactly why this kind of thing creates problems, as I'll explain. This event with Horus is troubling because it violates the law of causality. We are of course also assuming that we're not subscribing to the concept of multiple timelines, which from a few sources do seem to potentially be also a thing in 40k, 
but do you really want us to go off on that thread? Nope, okay, great. Because seriously, I'm choosing to opt out from the multiple timelines thing because it just gets horribly, horribly complicated. And it's alluded to here and there in the lore, but it could also be people just phrasing things differently. Maybe in the future we can get into that concept, but for now, I'm putting a pin in it. Also, just to tease you, I did find references to the possibility of the 40k galaxy, or at least the warp being an omniverse. But to be fair, it was from first edition supplement, and it's an offhand reference that's very unclear. It's not a strong enough source to base anything on, but we can also discuss that in the future. This is a place of worship, says Horus. The demon nodded and said, it is an entire world given over to the praise of the emperor. But why? The emperor is no god. He spent centuries freeing humanity from the shackles of religion. This makes no sense. Not from where you stand in time, but this is the Imperium that will come to pass if events continue on their present course, said the demon. The Emperor has the gift of foresight, and he has seen this future time. For what purpose, says Soros? To destroy the old faiths, so that one day his cult would more easily supplant them all. No, said Horus, I won't believe that. My father always refuted any notion of divinity. He once said of ancient earth, that there were torches who were the teachers, but also extinguishers who were the priests. He would never have condoned this. Yet this entire world is his temple, the demon said. And it is not the only one. The most twisted part of the exchange is of course where the demon explains that these events will come to pass if events continue on their present course. This is deliberately manipulative, and we cannot know if the demon even has any free will in this situation because it fails to mention the critical information that these events are caused by Horus turning away from the Emperor. The demon frames this to make it sound as if Horus continues to remain to be loyal to the Emperor, this is the future he'll run into. Clearly this is not the case, and the demon knows it. Again, dismissing the concept of multiple possible futures because that really is a road I don't think it's constructive or necessary for us to go down. As we see it from the perspective in the novel, we are in the present time, except by showing Horus these visions, the actual act of showing him and his subsequent reactions are not the problematic cause and effect that we need to consider. The actual cause of Horus's reaction and his subsequent interpretation of the visions shown by the demon is not the literal process of him being shown the vision, that's merely the conduit. The cause is of course his own actions that will take place in the future actions that will then ultimately create the future that is shown to him in the visions, in his past. The cause, or a significant part of it anyway, of Horus's turning takes place in the future, not the past. The effect of the future actions via the demon's vision are felt by him in the past, causing him to choose the path which will then continue this time loop. And this reverse process violates the laws of causality. This type of situation is more specifically referred to as a predestination paradox. Now, a paradox simply described is something that has a logically unacceptable conclusion. So if you're willing to accept that something is full of paradoxes, you're basically saying that you no longer care about logic at all. At which point, basically, anything goes. Anything can happen, nothing has any rules. For me, this just takes things that previously were interesting and or dramatic because of how events unfolded and just kind of makes them pointless and a waste of time. This is why I am not especially a huge fan of time travel being thrust into worlds which could well do without it. I am a fan of time travel, but not where it has a habit of undermining the logic of key events because once that's happened, it damages the foundations of things, and will then usually steadily undermine everything else. The situation with the warp and our material reality is annoyingly an even worse situation, because it attempts to align and even intersect a realm which has no laws relating to time or physics stacked up against one that does. And on that basis alone, it's set up for problems right from the start. So for anyone who had up until now thought or had read others explain about this idea that the Chaos Gods existed forever, it might well be a fun idea. But as I said before, it also somewhat, if not fully, has a habit of breaking everything else. That's if you're taking it all fairly seriously, of course. Now coming back to our Horus turning example. It is true in a sense that Chaos are the cause of Horus becoming a traitor, but in a weirder realisation, he actually causes himself to turn to Chaos, 
In linear time, a cause should always precede an effect. If this is reversed, then it can create a closed time loop and a paradox, which is the case here with Horus. It's possible that he wouldn't have turned against the Emperor had he not been shown this vision of the future, if we are assuming that choice is even an option and multiple options are viable. But the process he enters into is not a reasonably logical one, and his vision leads to him taking actions which then cause the future that is shown to him, a future which will then lead him to take those actions to cause that future, and so on. This process is not logical because it creates a larger problem caused by this, and indeed by most closed time loop events, in that as a result they make the past, present and future hard, if not impossible, to determine from a causal perspective. Now I'll put a pin in that and we'll come back to this very shortly. Firstly, I'll just say that this kind of time loop situation is why time travel, unless handled mechanically well, is not a favourite of mine to just casually throw into a narrative or universe. More often than not it's handled very lazily and creates numerous paradoxical situations and these can then undermine any larger narrative attempting to be told, making the whole thing basically, as I said already, feel like a pointless waste of time. And this is often very annoying because most of the principles around time travel and causality from a layman's version without all the math anyway are actually not especially difficult to understand. So it's frustrating when time travel is just wedged in to either prop up a narrative or form some convoluted plot device. Many physicists already consider time travel to the past to be essentially impossible because generally speaking it's agreed upon that time is a linear unidirectional stream. This is obviously based on our real-world understanding of time and the laws which exist in our material reality. In the warp, these laws do not apply. Of course, as I am regularly more than happy to point out, 40k is not based strictly on reality. That's a shock, I know. But whether or not we like it, time travel is very much a thing in the world of 40k. It's been referenced numerous times with weird ancient entities, self-aware dark age of technology spacecraft, and so on. As I say though, I often feel this isn't a great idea because whilst it's tantalising as a plot device for authors, time travel just even at its simplest has a habit of making things incredibly complicated, especially when we might consider that there are different concepts of time travel. And you start to get into things like multiple realities, timelines, time loops, scenarios like the grandfather paradox, closed timelike curves, so on. Now if we were talking only about the warp, that does give us more breathing space. Not to mention, of course, that whenever anyone is travelling through the warp in a ship, they are effectively already time travelling. It's actually surprising it doesn't cause even more confusion in the Imperium than already exists, honestly. Because Gellerfield or no, just the distances and time differences across the galaxy are going to be so vast, the logistical implications are just insane. This is already semi-referenced where planets that may suddenly find themselves besieged by Xenos, even if they get a message out, may be attended from one perspective fairly quickly, but on arrival it turns out the planet's actually been dead for centuries. This is not an unusual thing to occur in the Imperium, and especially when you're sending communications over distances and so on. So let us consider a realm without time. Let's start with that. How does that work? Well, we know because the law tells us it's incomprehensible. Now, for me, that's simply not good enough, I'm afraid. One might want to argue that in an eternal realm which has no reasonable concept of time, because it has never existed for them, this could be problematic for the entities therein, as they would have no way of perceiving time in the linear sense as we understand it, meaning their ability to take specific purposeful actions would become almost random or meaningless, because if they're darting in and out of the warp, and time varies seemingly almost at random, the idea of following up previous actions in reality from the warp is obviously highly confusing. You could also assume from our perspective anyway that this could make it extremely difficult for entities in the warp to say locate events or find individuals if from their perspective they are seeing across the entire scale of time as it has existed in the material realm. Or as we learned earlier, time is apparently perceived even separately by all individuals within the warp. So how the hell does that work? Let's imagine that we exist in the warp and we're trying to find a specific event or individual to locate. It'd be like attempting to find a grain of sand floating randomly in space, lost at some place at some time across the entire galaxy, and also its continually changing position. 
One thing we do know is that warp entities have already taken specific and planned actions into the material realm, so we can at least assume they have some way of engaging specifically with events in our reality. Alternatively, if you want to take the excessively simplistic, non-thinking option, then you may be happy with the explanation that it's just the nature of the Chaos Gods and it's all godlike and essentially they just know all in air quotes. That they are just somehow able to, by ways we cannot fathom, to sense a very established version of our timeline. It's all laid out for them to move us mortals around like some eternal galactic board game. It's a pretty lazy way to explain it, but if that works for you, then fine I guess. But given you're here and already this far through the video, I'm assuming you aren't lazy when it comes to these things, so let's continue. Now I'll just say as well that in relation to this idea that because the warp observes no time, the Chaos Gods could appear at any point and have theoretically always existed, even if we were to assume that we still should remember that the Chaos Gods cannot exist in material space, they can of course reach out and touch the minds of mortals to sway things in their favour. They're able to push demons out into the material world, while again remembering that this can only happen in very specific circumstances like possession, willing mortal vessels, weak psychers, warp storm tears, ritual summoning and so on. It also requires great amounts of energy from the warp in order to do this stuff. As we uncover past details of ancient times, you'll see how this relationship becomes inherently more complicated. But for now, let's just take it as read that the Chaos Gods could be anywhere at any time throughout history. We still have no real idea about how much of their actions are limited. Do they have more power to exert relative to different periods in the material realm? Or is all the emotional and spiritual energy across time just absorbed en masse like some kind of collective finite energy reserve? Unknown. And again, not so easy to even wrap your head around. This concept itself gets more complicated because if certain events have to occur, that is to say as part of a closed time loop, then would certain amounts of warp energy that are necessary be pre-designated in a sense? The more you think about it, the worse it gets. And especially if you then get into discussing things like a closed time-like curve or grandfather paradox. So let's get into that. The simplest way to explain a closed time-like curve would be a trajectory through space-time that allows for time travel to the past without exceeding the speed of light. You could also describe it as a path in space-time that returns to its starting point. And movies like Primer are a good reference for this. The Grandfather Paradox is another well-known and it's a very straightforward example of a paradox. The concept being that if you say went back in time to kill your grandfather, then you could not have existed. So consequently, you couldn't have travelled to the past to kill your grandfather, so then he's alive. Which means you do exist, and you can then go back in time to kill your grandfather. And so on. It creates a paradox. In the movie Primer, the two time travellers attempt to avoid any paradoxical situations by isolating themselves away from the world during their present time for a set period, so that when they then travel back in time to that previously set point where they isolated themselves, they theoretically avoid issues of causality. It's a very clever film and one of the best representations of time travel that's been handled well. Of course their best intentions turn out to be fairly impossible and the whole thing becomes very complicated. Incidentally, if you've never seen Primer, I strongly urge you to do so. Anyway. These kind of paradoxes are one element that have led physicists to generally agree time travel to the past to be impossible, along with some others suggesting that our universe isn't even capable of containing something like a closed time-like curve. These issues though don't necessarily apply for us, because that relies on us being able to reasonably define what is and isn't possible within the warp, or to say how chaos gods and even demons may or may not be able to travel through time. It could also be that the notion of being able to travel forward or back to a specific point may not be something warp entities even have any control of, or perhaps even they understand how inherently dangerous it might be to try and manipulate a timeline, or timelines depending on which construct of time travel you are subscribing to, and how you may want to speculate on the concept of timelines. We have a tendency to immediately think of a place without time as a realm where you could easily just reach out or visit any point in time, more specifically choose to affect those events there. Except there's nothing really to suggest that's actually the case one way or the other in regards to the warp. Regardless of how or if warp entities could consciously move to specific points in time, the whole thing brings up problems, simple little problems like, you know, violating the laws of causality and entropy. 
With causality in our material realm, we generally consider both time and consequently causation has a singular direction. You cannot take an action that will cause an effect in what we see as the past, because the past has already happened and that's now permanently behind us in time. For example, you take an action to push a glass off of a table, thus causing it to fall and smash. You cannot undo this effect and the cause has already occurred. The other being the law of entropy or the second law of thermodynamics, that systems will always flow from a state of order to a state of disorder, meaning that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. A simple example of this would be heat dispersal, the law of entropy describing why heat energy will flow from hot to cold but not the other way around. Another example, you're caught in a time travelling loop where you give an essential item to your past self which you will then in the future have to of course return to the past and give again to continue the loop. But because that item is constantly moving forward in time in a linear fashion as the loop continues, the object should age, that is to say its entropy or disorder should increase. But if that were true, then it should eventually deteriorate to a point beyond it becoming practically usable. It can no longer function as the essentially required object within the event, and so the time loop would break down, and at that point nor could the loop have ever begun. In order for a time loop like this to exist, it would need to break the law of entropy. Now of course there are arguably a couple of ways around that very specific example, like transcribing the book to a new book, but even then, where did the book originate? Where's the starting point? What if it was a more complex item that you could not replicate? These are the kind of problematic paradoxes that occur with travelling to the past, as well as giving either information or instructions that don't occur with travelling to the future, but especially with entropy in terms of using critical objects that create a recurring time event. Whereas travelling to the future, as I say, it doesn't have these problems, and so that's generally considered to be theoretically possible. These kind of paradoxes have many names, but are often fairly closely related or even somewhat ambiguous. Generally speaking though, they are what I have already referred to as a closed time loop, which is exactly as it sounds, a closed period of time that continues to loop. So even if the Chaos Gods were able to move around through our linear timeline and take actions to influence events or even themselves, those events could become what is referred to as we just said before, a closed time loop, specifically a predestination paradox or a bootstrap paradox. A predestination paradox is where a series of events which could be perceived as the past or present lead to a future event, and that future event though will be the ultimate cause of the first event in the past. The reason why this is paradoxical is that the past event only occurs because of the action in the future event. A bootstrap paradox is very similar, but usually involves some physical object, like the book we mentioned previously. That object would then cause a series of events not dissimilarly to the predestination paradox. And as we just covered, this is problematic because in a sense that object has never specifically originated from anywhere. It's a paradox. Examples of this would be events in movies like Terry Gilliam's 12 Monkeys and also The Terminator. In both these movies, the main characters are stuck in the described causal loops. In Terminator, a future self-aware AI, Skynet, sends the T-800 or Model 101 Terminator back through time to assassinate Sarah Connor in an attempt to alter the future. Her son John Connor sends Carl Reese back also to try and save Sarah, while additionally already knowing that by doing so, Carl will become his father in the past. When the Terminator is eventually destroyed, the leftover components of the T-800 Terminator sent by Skynet will enable the reverse engineering of the Terminator's CPU and other materials, something that it seems could not have occurred otherwise. In a deleted scene from the movie, we even discover that the facility where the final battle takes place between Sarah Connor, Carl Reese and the Terminator is in fact an early stage site for Cyberdyne systems. That was a scene removed from the original screening. Their arrival at this location at the end of the film seems accidental on the part of Sarah and Carl, who are just running to find somewhere to escape. But in this chance decision, they set up a whole future chain of events. Events, of course, that paradoxically couldn't have happened were it not for the Terminator being sent to the past. And this suggests, in contradiction to Sarah's assertion, things are actually locked into a time loop. Their arrival at the Cyberdyne facility may have just seemed random to them, but it could have in fact been predestined and despite the illusion of it, they had no free will in deciding that they were going to arrive there. This is just one possibility of course. Regardless though, these kind of causality loops could be created by any number 
of scenarios and involve objects or just information. So returning to 40k, let's for example say you as a Chaos God gain information from your future self. This needn't be meeting yourself and having an actual one-to-one -one conversation, but regardless you learn of a critical action you must take, say influencing the Eldar into depravity at a certain point to ensure that you are born. Now I'm not saying that's how it happened, but it's just an example of a predestination paradox. These causal loops nearly always have a paradoxical nature, which means you ultimately then become logically unable to determine where the cause occurs. Because if the cause was in the future, creating an effect in the past, you couldn't have reached that future without being affected by the past which is going to cause the future, which then leads you to a final position where you are unable to determine the origin of anything. And this is the final and most destructive impact of a causal loop. And it's something that is usually just put to one side in movies or general pop culture. And the reason it's put to one side is because it undermines the entire concept of past, present and future because they are defined by causality. If a future action is capable of causing a past effect, if that sequence of events is even feasible, you can no longer say that the past is definitively the past. Once you've moved into the future, the past should already have happened and be inaccessible. And so these time-travelling sequences of events render linear time essentially meaningless. And this is the big problem with all this kind of stuff. Now, the whole point of talking about this, I hope, is beginning to become obvious. That it highlights just how problematic the concept of a realm without any laws of time actually is. Along hand in hand with the whole Chaos Gods have always existed spiel. Now, as I said from the beginning, it sounds simple enough when you see it or hear it as a passing quote or an offhand remark by somebody who's talking about law and Chaos Gods. When you actually start to engage the brain and you think about it further and what no time and always having existed actually means, it creates any number of fairly major problems. And that's not all, because in 40k, the warp has no laws of time. Fine, we understand that now to be the case. From there, things unfortunately get even more complicated and troublesome than they already were. Because if we're talking about the concept of time in just one reality, one dimension, that of our own, say, material realm, we might be able to rationalise and make some conclusions about that. Perhaps to do with how those in such a reality observe time and so on. Or even getting into tackling about multiple timelines, etc. Right? But in 40k, it's not just one reality. And this is where it becomes difficult to reasonably reconcile. Because you have two realms with extremely contradicting laws, somehow apparently coexisting, and worse, also connected with each other. Having a dimension that sits parallel to another like the Materium and Immaterium, one with linear time and one without, is so extremely difficult to come to a reasonable resolution over. Not to mention that if you read the law as it is, back in the very early period of the galaxy or the universe, the Materium and the Immaterium apparently were not even as closed off from one another as they are in the present age of the Imperium, which I will make some vague expansions on in future videos. But again, if you just think about that, that confliction there, it's just massively problematic. Still, let's try and just take what we do know now. The warp exists as a realm without time and interacts with our material realm, which does. And that brings us to backwards causation. We've now covered and understand the nature of causal paradoxes, and often discussions around chaos and the warp lead to the idea that those demons and gods who exist within the warp would be able to, and we know have, influence or cause effects in what we would see from our linear perception as the past. It's worth reminding that the chaos gods themselves pay extremely minimal attention to the mortal realm. They only take note when events or individuals shine extremely brightly, and from that you could fairly assume most of the time they are either entirely unaware of anything that we would describe as time, instead they merely now and then see an action or sequence of events that they choose to engage with, or perhaps consequently have little true free will over such things, and just somehow know that they have to play their role in this. Let us consider having two dimensions existing in parallel, one with apparently no time and one with linear time, is inherently illogical. 
because somehow being able to connect to a realm free of causality and without time creates so many conceptual problems. But just for argument's sake, if you were able to exist in, say, an adjacent dimension where time had no meaning, if so, would that be a physical journey? Or would it be more like a sea of invisible information, thoughts, feelings, memories, instinctive gut feelings, just randomly becoming apparent, vague and somewhat like a precognition? How can we reconcile this idea of backwards causation caused by those in the warp in our material reality? That is to say future events causing actions in the past. Well, it brings us to where all this has been leading to, which is that we have to consider looking at things from what is called an eternalist view of time. And this states that time is symmetrical. Essentially what it's saying is that the past, present and future all already exist. The sensation of what we would refer to as the present is just an effect of human consciousness. It's basically an illusion. But then in reality, our conscious mind and subsequent decisions have no actual bearing on how events play out. There's some evidence in the law that points toward the concept of causality being absent and that there are no restrictions on past, present and future. In Rise of the Inari Wild Rider, the Eldar Farseer Ulthran describes how raw warp power knows nothing of causality. Here there was no boundary to what had been, what was, and what might come to pass. The description of what might come to pass I think is either a personal view of Ulthran or trying to keep some mystique about events, but in order for things to really make sense we have to accept that all these things exist. The Eldar do regularly make mention throughout their lore and narratives to cyclical time and their very society is built around concepts of cycles, which points heavily toward an eternalist point of view. So keeping that in mind, you might begin to see from its description of all things already existing as to why I said earlier, time travel has a habit of making things become much less enjoyable. Because no one likes to think that their actions have already taken place and that free will is an illusion. Because it basically makes everything seem meaningless. And that's what happens when you start interjecting time travel or impossible to reconcile concepts like no laws of time all over the place. Still, we have to enable the idea of backwards causation to work, as it's something that's already established in 40k, so we accept the idea of an eternalist view of time. We must then accept that future events already exist in order to have causal loops in what we could call the past. Something else which points to this is an Eldar myth known as the Cosmic Serpent. The serpent is the only creature believed to exist in both the material and the psychic realm at the same time. Hence, the serpent is said to be all-knowing across all of time. This probably also points towards some visions and concepts of Ouroboros and other things which are relative to the various different pieces in the whole puzzle. So, as we already discussed, when we then come to the idea of causal loops, we no longer have any way of defining where a chain of events began. There's also no choice involved because otherwise it becomes logically impossible. So this gives us the unfortunate conclusion that there's no free will involved in anything. Let's just sidestep around that quite depressing and extremely dull conclusion by using a philosophical argument that any mortal's conscious perception of free will is something you truly feel to your very core, and that whether such a sensation is real in any metaphysical sense is ultimately irrelevant and unquantifiable to you. You are unable to perceive your actions any other way other than being through your own free will. So to all intents and purposes, free will does exist. Or to put it more simply, what we're saying is, let's just not think about that too much, because it makes things very boring, as I said. Time travel. Unfortunately, to make this mess of conflicting concepts work, the Eternalist view is the only one that allows us to put together some of these pieces of the puzzle. So then, with this idea that everything already exists across time, that would mean the Chaos Gods can surely see the end game. They can and should already know every single action to take, right? Because they can see everything. Well, obviously not. It clearly can't work that way, otherwise it already would have and they already would have done. We could consider though that just as you may suddenly become aware of a memory from your past or something in the present that triggers a feeling from your memory, the same could be said but in reverse here. It would be more like a feeling or a vision of a future event but without it literally having been delivered to you via some interaction or object 
as per our previous examples. Movies like Arrival touch on this idea of eternalist time and on perceiving memories from your past and future. These feelings would be more like a sense of purpose washing over you, where you didn't know where in time you were, only that you gain a sense of purpose on understanding that such a thing has to happen. Maybe you receive information in a vision, but until a subsequent event occurs, you are perhaps unsure of how that information is usable. It could be that in the warp, because of its abstract lawless nature, certain feelings or memories from what we could see as the past or the future only become brighter and more apparent when they align with events from our perceived linear interpretation of time. A time-like alignment of sense and events. That events in our reality could create situations predetermining causal loops, then requiring actions by those entities in the warp. Now, I came to this from thinking about what I said earlier, where the difficulty of existing in a realm with no concept of time could prevent you from taking any specific pointed actions in the material realm, but also us knowing that they have apparently already taken some specific actions, which then have caused these closed time loops. If you couldn't easily actually locate that moment, you'd have to feel compelled to do it by some other process, perhaps even outside of your own conscious free will. So in a realm where time is non-linear or even non-existent, such as the warp, you could become aware of time as more of a cyclical or even a completely abstract concept, or more simply perhaps just no concept of it at all. Example, in your mind you suddenly have memories or information you previously were unaware of, more specifically of actions you feel a compelling need to take to ensure a certain event occurs. It might be so compelling you cannot resist the need even outside of your own will. You might see a whole sequence of events where specific actions were necessary or that you at least felt were necessary, but maybe were unaware of the order or the implications until other events occurred first. This would then cause you to take actions similarly to Horus in order to bring about the resulting predestined events. So with all of this said, I cannot conclude that all of the Chaos Gods have always been fully manifested in the warp, despite it even stating in the lore in regard to Slanesh. Now calm down, okay? Sit back down, because the key word here for me is fully manifested. I find it very difficult to accept the concept of Slanesh always having existed, because seriously think about it. It's very difficult to reconcile the contradictions and problems such a truth would represent. If they have always existed, how were there times when the Eldar, for example, don't have to worry about their souls being devoured? That was a long time. Or that through the period of galactic Eldar dominion, they weren't wrought then by feelings of wanting to slaughter each other, scheming to subvert their peaceful time. Yet later, seemingly out of nowhere, things spiral out of control. If Slanesh always had existed, why didn't that happen right out of the gate? Now look, there's a lot more to it than that. But I think in actuality, where we find ourselves here is back at the mercy of semantics, especially when the only source for such statements are as his rival gods reckon it. Because that's what it says in the Codex, Slanesh has existed for all time as his rival gods reckon it. To me, this just comes across as the other gods' perception, and not necessarily having any literal bearing on strictly how long something has existed. If anything, it could suggest the opposite, that they perceive Slanesh has always existed, but they only see things that way because they have no point of reference, no way of gauging it or describing it. They can't say that that's the past and this is the future, so to them, it seems like Slanesh has always existed because they can't understand it any other way. With all that said, I would be fine with the concept that they may have existed forever in some sense. Being that the warp is a sea of souls and emotional energy, I could very much entertain the idea that for a long time before becoming self-aware, a Chaos God would be a mass and reactive formation of compatible emotional energies, and that this formation could reach out and touch the minds of mortals as and when it felt compelled to do so, even before it was born into the warp in truth and became conscious. For example, if we assume the gods have always existed in some sense within the warp, Slanesh may have suddenly found that memories or emotional instincts from the future of its creation before it's really properly sentient as a purely instinctual entity to reach out and begin to try and influence the Eldar, who, due to a couple of other reasons, are also kind of a bit weakened at this point. 
So Slanesh wouldn't have been creating, but was maybe severely worsening the Eldar's slide down into depravity before their eventual annihilation. As I already said, the concept of a Chaos God being physically manifested within the warp for all time, yet also specifically being born through events by its adjacent material realm, literally makes no sense whatsoever, and that should be obvious. Not only because of the connected events of the material realm, but also just by the definition of their whole nature that the Chaos Gods use psychic energy and souls from mortal creatures. And this is why the thinking that I've seen some people say before that the birth of a god is a point in time that we see, but that they have truly existed throughout all of time. That doesn't make sense once you actually start to think beyond just that description. Instead, the idea that for me seems most plausible is again, it's a little bit semantics. The sense that the Chaos Gods have always existed, but specifically not as a literal warp manifested form. Okay, so they have always existed, but from our point of view, they haven't always been there and even been there to influence things. They are of the warp as much as the warp is them. And when it comes to specific events, knowledge or actions that would then create a closed time loop, it's impossible to say definitively just how that functions. In a reality where time simply doesn't exist, it's hard to imagine that the gods can be aware of such minuscule moments in time when time for them doesn't exist in any perceivable sense. My personal conclusion is that they only become aware of information and actions through a very chaotic, perhaps even a random process, which to me seems somehow all the more appropriate. There is no clearly defined or documented explanation for how any of this works, which should be of no surprise to anyone. But I've spent solid time thinking it through, and this is the only way I've been able to reconcile having a dimension with no concept or perception of time that is not only adjacent to but also interacting with a realm which has a very contradictory, well-defined perception of time as a linear unidirectional stream. Now when we eventually come to the third video, I will flesh out things a lot more, but just simply, I don't believe the Chaos Gods have always been manifested. Yet, as I said, they may have been largely present in some form or state. What it comes down to though, really, is that this idea of the warp being devoid of time is problematic. It does to be sure provide plenty of material for our amusement. I love the idea that I've seen said somewhere before that for some Chaos Space Marines who exist in the warp, the Black Crusades from their perception are more like a weekly event, where they return through the Eye of Terror, regroup quickly, restock, and like, right lads, let's get back out there, we're gonna smash the Imperium this time, when in actuality as they emerge from the warp, for humanity it's been like a thousand years. And this kind of thing is illustrated as I said earlier in the Night Lord's novel, Voidstalker. And here's the other thing, anybody can spin off wild theories about what lies beyond. For example, maybe we've only seen the first Chaos Gods, maybe there are more than four. Perhaps the warp is the true reality and we're living in a false illusion of reality. Maybe the warp is not a localised mirror of our galaxy, but of the whole or many universes, and it's all just so far beyond our comprehension. You get the idea. If I spent some significant time joining random dots of lore together, I'm sure I could conjure up an endless stream of mad theories about origins and the future of things, if I felt compelled to do so. Because just randomly fitting ideas into an already very fragmented framework isn't that hard to do. What's important to remember is that anybody can think up some crazy nonsense, because when you have no restrictions, you can make anything work, and just fit and adjust the pieces as you go along. In doing so, you're likely to find yourself eventually stranded too far, or badly contradicting other elements that you never considered. And then, you're no longer operating within the universe that has been created and exists. And this is why often when I see posts from people starting off stating that their theory is based around other theories, and maybe even a theory based off of some unofficial fan fiction, you usually find people exiting pretty quickly. Because while it's fun, if all we're doing is an exercise in creative writing, it's subjectively pointless in terms of trying to understand the official lore that is. But to be clear, please understand, I'm not suggesting that fan fiction is pointless. In fact, I hope to get into writing some of my own stuff soon. But I personally only enjoy fan fiction when that exists within the established law and boundaries. Because when you start reaching out wildly beyond that, it's no longer part of the actual world we're invested in. So I hope that's clear and all makes sense. What's actually a difficult undertaking, and why I think so often we see people referring to say things like, well, I don't have a source, but let me tell you what I think. It's because taking what you already know 
and combining it with the documented history, the constraints of reality as we know it, and limiting yourself to only a few established pieces to make sense of the puzzle, then having to find a way to make those pieces fit is a much more challenging task and actually often requires some deep thought, even additional reading. And that's just not so easy. Think about it like this, okay? Adding extra dots to join the dots is all well and good, so long as you're placing them where it seems appropriate and not just all over the place, because otherwise you're going to end up with a picture that looks nothing like at all what was originally designed. And for some people, that might be what they want. But I personally want to know what the original image was. It's like finding a few pieces of a puzzle and then cutting out the missing ones you want with any pattern to make it fit. Technically, yes, you have formed, laid out and finished your puzzle, but by just making up your own pieces which don't even match with the original as you went along, it's self-defeating and in the end, whilst you have filled in all the gaps, it just looks wrong. My personal opinion is that most people want to use the official pieces of the puzzle and maybe speculate where the blank pieces may go or what pieces are needed to fit, but always building those guesses reasonably off of what is already set even if that means having to live with a few blank spaces toward the edge. But at least they know that those pieces that they do have are the right pieces. So at the end of this first video, we've learned about the basic framework which is important to understand before we deal with the rest. So what I'm going to do is illustrate for you my best conceptualization of the warp's relationship to the material reality, including the issues around time. And this is as follows. Imagine the warp is a vast and infinite ocean. Scattered across that ocean are islands that are vast distances apart. These islands are the material worlds that exist in our reality, each representing and linked with all others. The complete and invisible process of linear time or the eternalist time as perceived by those who live in the material realm is always there and overlays this whole realm of the materium. The two realms are inexorably connected. One is constantly shifting, it has tides and currents and it can be very dangerous or relatively calm. At certain times it can be ferocious, crashing and lashing itself against the solid islands or forming dangerous vortices out on the ocean itself, sometimes isolated, other times enveloping islands or whole sections and cutting off worlds from the others. Were they to be so enveloped by storms, it's possible that they could even exist outside of the constant time of the material realm, at least until those storms subside, and it returns to a state of relative calm. But some areas may always be turbulent. Upon these islands exist powerful, bright entities trapped in corporeal vessels, and these are the souls of mortal creatures, not the Eldari though. And when these mortal spirits are released from their vessels, their energy, especially when released en masse, could be envisaged as a seismic force, having a more powerful effect upon the shifting current and relative state of calm of the ocean in the other realm. The continual seeping of emotions and conscious thought into the ocean of the warp is more like a gradual shifting of temperature and salinity, creating movement to the coalescing emotional forces within the Sea of Souls itself. The more severe the seismic force, the more powerful the resulting storm or extreme event can be. The ever-changing wax and wane of galactic emotions directly relative to how strongly the ocean breaks upon the shores of reality. You may then imagine specific events that occur as vessels or flotsam that are permanently moored to the solid land and realm of reality, yet upon the ocean they can drift and move around in an incomprehensible state of random disorder. They're never set at permanent coordinates from the perspective of those in the warp itself. Some may appear always to be adjacent, even connected. Others are not at all ordered. Importantly, no matter their actual position upon the ocean at any moment, they're always permanently tethered or moored to a specific, unchanging point on the solid land of reality. And no matter the forces, tides and storms on the ocean itself, that position will not change. From the land though, unlike the confusing disorder of the ocean, these tethered moments always appear in their same position, specific and never changing. So then we go one step deeper. The gods of chaos exist within the further depths of the ocean. They are the gods or the monsters of this realm. Some of these vessels, these events that float at random upon the ocean are tethered by a second line to them. They can be tethered to demons or other entities or multiple entities that exist and reside in the warp. 
and while they are technically able to see all the events of the material reality at once existing as they do within the ever-shifting deep currents of the ocean, it can be difficult to see those events with clarity. Perhaps when certain events that are directly connected to an entity within the ocean, that psychic tether tugs and pulls like a fishing line to get their attention, yet unlike fishing, one is always hooked to the line, and the chances of getting off of it are very small if not impossible. But when that line pulls, the actions that are needed are just a matter of course. The difficult thing for us to reconcile is whether or not the future has already happened. All things considered, we may have to accept that this is in fact the case. Because not only does that actually play out in some of the different races in the galaxy in terms of their lore, but it also makes the most logical sense in terms of the restrictions that exist and that we have to work around. Also knowing that one reality through established events inevitably interacts with the other. No matter their present actions, they will always be connected to specific events, and those events will always be connected to the land of reality, where they occupy a specific and ordered point in time from the perspective of those who exist upon that solid landmass. Now all of this is fairly difficult to reasonably reconcile, it's certainly open to individual interpretation. To me, this is how I loosely and very simplistically imagine the relationship between the warp and reality. The disorder of one is in many ways irrelevant to the other. In the warp time has no specific meaning, but the events seen from the ocean of the warp, no matter how they're perceived by the entities therein, will always be permanently connected to specific points in the material reality. From a mortal point of view, we are only able to view those events in a specific order, because we're constrained by the laws that govern the material realm, but in the warp, they can be perceived and visited in any order. How malleable any of this is, how much you could truly alter time, is very unclear. Have all events and actions already occurred? Are mortal figures simply just playing them out over and over again? Can individuals within the warp and the material realm truly have an impact on those events? Are some more easily able to be shifted? And does the slightest movement of one create a chain effect of entanglement that would lead to unknown, disastrous consequences? Who can really say? We will continue in part two, where we'll learn about the origins of the galaxy and the war in heaven and its implications. We'll also learn in detail about Eldar mythology, which has a heavy bearing on much of this. Finally, in part three, we'll pull all of these various factors together to make conclusions. So as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all soon in part two.